Um, I want to just introduce our speakers tonight before we get started. Um, Cecilia Garland is the founder and executive director of Bataan Legacy Historical Society. She founded the organization to address the lack of information about the role of the Philippines during World War II in the, uh, to see, and to seek justice for the Filipino veterans whose benefits were rescinded in 1946. Uh, she um, is documenting the stories of survivors and veterans of World War II in the Philippines and was inspired by her father, Louis Garland Jr., a Filipino veteran at, of World War II and a survivor of the Bataan Death March. Um, we're really honored to be able to host her and also Stephen Haller from the National Park Service um, to talk about this really important event that many of us aren't familiar with, including myself. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the um, about the march and just the history of the Philippines. Um, so Stephen Haller is the historian for the National Park Service at Golden Gate National Recreation. He is responsible for historic preservation programs throughout this 80,000 acre national park next door with re responsibilities as varied as the notorious federal penitentiary on Alcatraz, the historic dairy ranching landscapes in Marin, and the adaptive reuse of nearly 800 historic structures in the park. He's a specialist in World War II military and naval history and encourages everyone to visit the nps.gov um, website and for further information on this subject. So please join me in welcoming Cecilia to the stage. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Good evening, everybody. I want to thank San Francisco Asian Art Museum for making this event possible and also the Filipino American History Month which will be celebrated this Sunday here at the Asian Art Museum. Thank you Sylvia, thank you Deborah Clearwaters and thank you to all the staff of the San Francisco Asian Art Museum. I am here because of my father. I'd like to show you a film which shows the genesis of Bataan Legacy Historical Society and why it was founded. I'm Luis Guerla Jr. I was part of the Bataan Death March. When I was a child growing up in the Philippines, my father used to tell us stories about the Second World War. His stories of his encounters with a Japanese enemy captured our young imaginations. He even made us laugh as he acted out many characters and made different sound effects. Many years later, I was inspired to write a historical novel called In Her Mother's Image, set during World War II in the Philippines. The war is seen through the eyes of an eight-year-old girl named Chiquita, who carries the emotional toll of war into adulthood. During public readings of my novel, I realized that not too many people know of what happened during the war in the Philippines including the infamous Bataan Death March. On April 9, 1942, after four months of bitter and intense fighting, approximately 63,000 Filipinos and 12,000 American soldiers, mostly suffering from disease and starvation, were forced to surrender to the Japanese Imperial Army. Between 10 to 15,000 Filipinos and 750 American soldiers died while marching to their prison camp some 60 miles away under extreme tropical conditions with no provisions for food, water, shelter, or medicine. Those who were too weak to go on were beaten, bayoneted, beheaded, or left to die by their Japanese captors, and those civilians who tried to help were subjected to the same treatment. Once inside their prison camp at Camp O'Donnell, another 30,000 died 
a majority of whom were Filipinos. I decided to learn more about what really happened to the men of Bataan, and to my dismay, I discovered that some books do not even mention the Filipino soldiers, even though they manned seven-eighths of the main line of resistance and did most of the fighting and the dying. Their role during the war has been ignored, derided, and in some instances even maligned. Moreover, nothing has been mentioned about the toll on the Filipino people who suffered massive atrocities under their Japanese captors. And then I found out about the awful truth how the defenders of Bataan and an entire nation were used, deceived, and sacrificed to win the war, and how the Filipino veterans were again betrayed in February of 1946, just five months after the war ended, when President Truman signed the first Surplus Recession Act which disbarred them from receiving any of their rightful benefits. This is the story of the tragedy of Bataan. This is the story of the Filipino defenders who, to this day, have not received honor nor justice. This is their legacy. Thank you. But that is all about to change. On July 14, 2016, the State Board of Education finally approved the inclusion of World War II in the Philippines in the U.S. History <laughs> Curriculum Framework for California. It's a start, but they've approved the history curriculum framework, which includes World War II in the Philippines. And this came about because of a mandate from a legislation passed in 2011, AB 199. The wording was, it encourages for the inclusion of the role of the Filipinos during World War II in the history social sciences curriculum for grade 7 to 12. Of course, it was not a requirement, so it took a lot of work, a lot of support from the community, and many of you are here who supported this. So in this curriculum, this will be mainly from the point of view, not just about the Filipinos, but the Americans and the civilians who made so much sacrifices during World War II in the Philippines. And these are the main points. In California, the California Department of Ed only issues the curriculum framework. So it's still up to each school district to implement this. And these are what's in the curriculum framework. They're supposed to teach this, but to preempt the school systems, we are starting to create a sample curriculum so that to ensure that the curriculum will be taught according to real history, to what really happened in the Philippines during World War II. For example, not too many people know that the U.S. Army forces in the Far East, it was comprised mainly of Filipinos. Seven-eighths of the main line of resistance were manned by Filipinos. Out of 149,000 troops, there were 19,000 Americans, 12,000 Philippine scouts, mostly Filipinos with American officers, and 119 Filipinos. So most of those who suffered were Filipinos. And then not too many people know too that the U.S. Army forces in the Far East, despite suffering from extreme starvation and illness, they were able to disrupt the timetable of the Imperial Japanese Army. 
And so these are the points that we made. Fortunately, they accepted all of our recommendations at the last minute. And uh, so these, these things, these points will now be in the history curriculum framework for California. And this will be the first time that this will be taught in high schools, not just in California, but in the United States. But, okay. but there is a lot more work to do. And so, but let me give you a brief background of what happened before the war. In 1897, the relationship between Japan and the United States. They actually clashed over the Hawaiian Islands in 1897, and in 1898, after the defeat of Spain, uh, the Philippines, along with Guam and Puerto Rico, were ceded to the United States for $20 million in accordance with the Treaty of Paris. And of course, in um, 1902, there was a Japanese-Anglo alliance, I'm going through this fast so we can get to the meat of the presentation. In 1905, actually 1904, there was the Russo-Japanese War when Japan attacked Russian troops in Incheon, Korea. They attacked first before declaring war, and this will be significant later on, on December 7, 1941. And President Teddy Roosevelt brokered a peace treaty between Russia and Japan, and he actually won the Nobel Peace Prize. In 1914, Japan occupies the German Pacific territories of the Marianas, Carolinas, and the Marshall Islands. 1921 and 22, the Washington Naval Conference took place, and it limited the tonnage of each Countries, navies, warships, the United States, Great Britain, Japan, Germany, so on. Hang on one second. And this is the map. In 1931, where is that here? Was Japan invaded Manchuria. And then in 1933, Japan quits the League of Nations, and they were no longer bound by the 1921 Washington Naval Treaty. And they started building its naval power. Fast forward, 1934, the Tidings McDuffie Act was passed. It was the Philippine Independence Act which provided for the establishment of a Philippine Commonwealth government in preparation for its independence in 10 years. However, it also limited the immigration of Filipinos here in the United States to 50 per year and reclassified the Filipinos already in the United States as aliens. President Manuel Quezon became the first president of the Philippine Commonwealth. Now in 1935, he asked his friend. They met as young men in the early 1900s. General Douglas MacArthur became the military advisor for the fledgling Philippine Commonwealth government. His father was General Arthur MacArthur, who used to be the military governor of the Philippines in 1900. And so he asked his old friend, General Douglas MacArthur, to become the military advisor. In 1937, we had the second Sino-Japanese War. The first one was 1894, and this one was the invasion of Shanghai, the infamous uh, Marco Polo Bridge, uh, which started the war. And then you've all heard about the rape of Nanking, where approximately 300,000 civilians died, Chinese civilians. 1939, Germany invades Poland on September 1, 1939. It was the beginning of World War II in Europe. That was also the beginning of the development of Rainbow Plan. These are a series of strategic defense plans in order to assist France and Great Britain. 
So in this war plan was a series of color-coded war plans. For Japan, was coded as orange. So you had what was called war plan orange. It was actually um, uh, uh, made early, about 1908, and then it was in 1920s when they actually uh, accepted uh, war plan orange. And then in August 1940, Japan established bases in Indochina. And in September of that year, we had the tripartite pact between Germany, Italy, and Japan. By the end of 1940, families of U.S. Navy in the Philippines were ordered back to the United States. Japan had flown seven missions in commercial aircraft across Luzon for photo reconnaissance, and spies were embedded in the Philippines and other Asian countries. You would hear about stories of uh, gardeners, ice cream vendors, and when the war broke out, they came out in their full uniform, full regalia. So these were typical stories that happened in the Philippines. And what they were doing was surveying the land so that during the war, Japan actually had better maps than the U.S. Army forces in the Far East. In November of 1940, there was a memo called the Plan Dog Memo by Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Harold, Harold R. Stark. And that was the beginning of the Europe First policy. Between January to April 1941, the American Dutch, British Dutch conversations took place. And the plan was to divert enemy strength from the Malay barrier. Rainbow Plan 5 called for defending the coastal frontier of the Philippines so long as that defense continues. And in May of 1941, U.S. Army dependents were sent back to the United States. June 25, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 8802, opening the defense industry to minorities. July 22, Japan occupies French Indochina, and the U.S. declared total embargo of scrap, iron, and oil. They also froze Japanese assets in the United States and the Philippines. July 26, four days later, President Roosevelt signed a military order federalizing all organized units in the Philippines into the service of the U.S. Army forces in the Far East. July 30, an American gunboat, Tutuila, was bombed by the Japanese in Chongqing, China. But it was only in September of 1941 that initial mobilization of Filipino troops happened. Now, the Filipino troops were given khaki uniform, canvas shoes, World War I Enfield and Springfield rifles, and half of the ammunitions also go back to World War I, so that 50% of the ammunition were duds. By mid-November, while negotiations were taking place in Washington, D.C., the commanders of the Imperial Japanese Army's 11th Air Fleet, the 14th Army, and the 5th Air Group met at Iwakuni Naval Air Base in Japan to prepare plans for coordination. Oh, okay. Let me hurry up. <laughs> November 27, there's a heightened state of alert. General MacArthur did not foresee war until April of 1942. So let me just hurry up. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire 
of Japan. 2.30 a.m. Philippine time, Pearl Harbor was bombed. By 3.30 a.m., General Sutherland, Chief of Staff for General MacArthur, who advised, received a call from Washington, D.C., advising of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. 5 a.m., General Lewis Brereton of the Far East Air Force asked permission to bomb the Japanese harbor in Takao, Formosa. Permission was denied. Between 9 a.m. and 10.20 a.m., Northern Luzon was bombed. 9.30 a.m., Camp John Hay in Baguio was bombed. By 11.30 a.m., Iba Air Base alerted of a large formation of planes from China Sea. By 12 o'clock, Iba Air Base was bombed. By 12.30, Clark Air Base was bombed. More than half of the B-17s and the P-40s were lost on the first day. December 9, Nichols Airfield was bombed, destroying the majority of the Far East Air Force. The men were transferred to infantry units. December 10 saw the first Japanese landing in northern Philippines. Sangli Naval Base in Cavite was bombed, destroying majority of the U.S. Navy. On December 13, there was no longer any air support except for a few fighters for reconnaissance. December 17, Japanese Army 16th Division landed in southern Luzon. MacArthur advised President Quezon of a possible move to Corregidor, an island two miles off the shores of Bataan. On December 22, saw the landing of General Homa's 14th Army in Lengayen. December 23rd, Admiral Hart, commander of the Asiatic Fleet, learns of the order to withdraw troops to Bataan through a Yusafid dispatch. War plan, War plan Orange 3 went into effect. December 24, U.S. Army forces started withdrawal to Bataan. General MacArthur, President Quezon, and Resident Commissioner Francis Sayer were evacuated to Corregidor. December 26, Manila becomes an open city. By January 2, Japan, Japanese troops enter Manila. January 5, the troops were already on half rations. January 11 to 12, the Army the U.S. Army was able to hold their line and inflicted heavy losses on the Japanese Army's 20th Regiment. On January 15, MacArthur sends a message to the troops that thousands of troops and hundreds of planes are being dispatched. No help ever came. On February 15, there was no more quinine in the field. There was a lull in the fighting. General Homa asked for fresh reinforcement. February, in March, Indonesia fell. Troops were already on quarter rations. Combat efficiency was down to 25%. 500 soldiers a day were afflicted with malaria, beriberi, and dysentery. And on March 12, MacArthur was ordered to leave the Philippines for Australia. By beginning of April, there were no longer any reserve troops. Fresh Japanese troops arrived from Formosa and Korea. April 3rd saw the beginning of a massive air and artillery bombardment by the Japanese army. April 7th, there were only two days worth of quarter rations and the lines were breached by the Japanese army. Little did the men know that their fate was already sealed. In Rainbow Plan 5, no reinforcements were going to be sent to the Philippines until the war in Europe was over. And so on April 9, 1942, General Edward King, Edward King, the commanding officer for Luzon forces was forced to surrender 75,000 troops consisting of 63,000 Filipinos and 12,000 Americans. Most of the troops were suffering from starvation and from disease. 
they were forced to march to their prison camp some 60 miles away with no provisions for food, water, shelter, or medicine. Those who could no longer go on were either beaten, shot, bayoneted, a few were beheaded. Approximately 10,000, 10 to 15,000 Filipinos and between 650 and 750 Americans died along the way in what is now known as the Bataan Death March. Once they reached their prison camp at Camp O'Donnell, another 20,000 Filipinos died and about 1,600 Americans died. Starting in 19, end of 42 and in 43, the American prisoners were taken to different labor camps in Formosa, Korea, Japan, and China. And they were used as slave laborers. Around four to 5,000 Americans died by friendly fire. They were shipped in ships called hell ships because conditions were so horrible. Up to now, this point of history is still not taught in schools about what happened to the American troops who were shipped to the labor camps. There is no pump, nothing. Right. It's just coming out from the... Right. Huh? So when everybody saw that, we all ran towards there. Right. Because the, the, it was summer, summer, the heat of summer, mm -hmm. April. Mm -hmm. So there comes a guy, he was uh, drinking like that. The, I don't know, uh, the, the guard, you know, just bayoneted him. You know? I saw those soldiers that is uh, from uh, Bataan when we were still walking in Bataan the, soldier, the Japanese soldiers they grabbed some girls and then they raped them another pregnant woman was bayoneted and you will re imagine she was carrying a baby he violated that woman, and for me, it's, I never forget that. I was crying, and it, it would hurt me very much until I, I never forget that for many, many years. Mm -hmm. and every time I remember, you know, it, I feel very sad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because let me uh, let me uh, continue. Uh, I'm I'm out of time right now, but let me just summarize it. Eventually, the entire Philippines was surrendered on May 6. Uh, the Filipinos uh, who were imprisoned, majority of them, but not all, uh, who were imprisoned at Camp O'Donnell were conditionally released uh, between August and September of 1942. In the meantime, the Americans were taken to another camp and eventually shipped abroad for the labor camps. And then the role of the guerrillas. This is something that will be included in the history curriculum framework because n the guerrillas were never given the credit of what they did during World War II. And it's incredible what they did, the amount of reconnaissance and sabotage to pave the way for the eventual liberation. General Douglas MacArthur in his famous speech of I shall return, he did return after three years, on October 20, 1944, with the help of the Seventh Fleet, but the battles of Leyte Gulf, this will also be included in the curriculum framework. Not too many people know that this is the largest naval battle in U.S. history. And it took place uh, near the Leyte Gulf between October 23 to the 26th 
of 1944. At the same time that the liberation was starting, it was also the beginning of a systematic extermination of the civilians and also prisoners. In December of 1944 in Palawan, there were 150 American prisoners. After the uh, alarm went off, they were forced into an air raid sh shelter. The Japanese guards doused the entrances with gasoline. Only 11 survived. They were able to escape. In Lipa, Batangas, 2,298 were executed by shooting, bayoneting. This was in February of 45. And in Los Baños, also in February, in retaliation for the rescue of 2,100 Allied prisoners, 1,500 civilians were executed in the town of Los Baños. And then so the Battle of Manila took place between February and March of 1945 and 100,000 civilians died during this battle. By the end of the war, approximately one million civilians died in the Philippines. And yet, five months after the war ended, this was in February of 1946, when President Truman signed the Recession Act, which deemed the service of the Filipinos as inactive, and therefore they could not qualify for the GI benefits. Until now, this has never been reversed. But as of today, we are nearing the uh, Congressional Gold Medal that will be awarded to the Filipinos. It was passed in the Senate, and now we have garnered enough co-sponsors so that it, hopefully it will be passed by the U.S. Congress. What it is, it will honor the Filipino veterans. There will be, it's not about the benefits, it's about the fact that they fought during World War II in the Philippines. I'm uh, going through the uh, slides. And we will have actually an exhibition opening on October 15 at the War Memorial Building uh, across the street. And um, just the last. Until now, I dream about me. They died so young to defend our country, the Philippines and the United States. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. United States... When President Franklin Roosevelt declared war against Japan, the ravages of war did not come to the United States. Six hours after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Japan invaded the Philippines, a commonwealth of the United States. What ensued in the next four years was a story that has been mostly forgotten. A story of courage and heroism by the Filipino and American soldiers who endured starvation and illness but were expected to fight to the death even though they were abandoned early on during the war. They were forced to surrender, only to suffer unspeakable horrors and death in the hands of their captors. A story of great sacrifice and suffering by an entire nation where a million civilians perished. This is their story. Your support and contribution will bring to life the stories of the last remaining survivors. Let us act now. Thank you very much.
And I'd like to inv invite Stephen Heller now to give his presentation. Hi, good evening. I'm, I'm glad to be here. And I was delighted when uh, Cecilia approached the National Park Service for assistance in doing research, um, particularly into the uh, connections between her story, or the story that she's telling, rather, and um, our local community. Now, some of you may know, because we've been doing our best to promote the fact that it's the 100th anniversary of the National Park System, which has been called America's best idea, at least by some. And one of the very important initiatives that we've resolved to undertake during our centennial year is to broaden um, our base of community support and to reach out to non-traditional uh, users of national parks so that we truly can represent all facets of the American story. And so helping Cecilia was a natural and it turned out that there were very substantial connections between your national park next door, Golden Gate National Recreation Area, Alcatraz, Muir Woods, and the Marin Headlands, and everything in between. Substantial connections between this place in your backyard and the story that Cecilia just told. And that's what I'm going to try to talk about today. Many of you have, may have been in the Marin Headlands or uh, have may, may have taken your uh, out-of-town family uh, for a drive um, out to uh, Cronkite Beach, uh, up to Sausalito, uh, over the Golden Gate Bridge, or uh, along the spectacular scenic road that winds from the Golden Gate Bridge along the crest of the Marin Headlands and looks down on the Golden Gate Bridge, a view that's so scenic that you see it in lots and lots of car commercials, so it must be good. Um, very few people, though, realize the connection between those roads and the stories of Bataan and Corregidor, and it's very tangible. In creating that story, we developed this map, uh, which is going to be used as part of the exhibition that uh, the Legacy Historical Society is about to open uh, across the way on Venice Avenue. And afterwards, we're going to have it on display at the Visitor Center in the, in the Marin Headlands. The names of the roads in the Marin Headlands are all derived from American soldiers that died in the defense of Bataan and Corregidor and led Filipino troops in defending their country. And what I want to do is tell you a little bit about their story. The defenses of Manila Bay that the United States Army erected in the early 1900s are eerily similar to the defenses that once protected San Francisco Bay from enemy battleships. They were built around the same time. The geography is rather similar. This is an 1862 map of San Francisco, uh, or of San Francisco Bay. You can see the Golden Gate, uh, sort of the narrow channel to the right. You can see Alcatraz Island in, in the middle. Alcatraz, um, Alcatraz, holds the exact same geographical relationship to the city of Manila and Manila Bay as Corregidor, sorry, <laughs> I got mixed up. Alcatraz holds the exact same geographical relationship to San Francisco Bay and the city of San Francisco as the island fortress of Corregidor holds to Manila Bay and the city of Manila. It's not generally known that the first use of Alcatraz uh, by the United States was not as a prison, but as a military fortification. 
and the Army built gun batteries on it to protect the inner harbor, and it, intend, and it built gun batteries on either side of the Golden Gate to protect the narrow harbor entrance. Eventually, uh, the guns grew in size and modernity and power uh, in order to duel with and win the duels with enemy battleships that might have approached uh, San Francisco Bay as part of an invasion force in the years before air power, before World War II, essentially. Eventually, guns like this uh, were, were established on both sides of the Golden Gate, and those of you that visit our national park and drive out to some of the scenic headlands have probably seen the abandoned gun batteries that still exist long after the guns were scrapped. They're so popular now primarily because they have great views, but that's exactly why the Army put them there, because they had great views. Great views to shoot, not photos at, this, at that point, but shells like you see there, 1,000-pound shells that could shoot as far as the Farallon Islands with great accuracy. Here's an example of one. There's a car commercial that runs, is taken from this exact same spot with a car on top of the thing. That's Battery Kirby. Battery Kirby uh, was disarmed in beginning in 1933, and those big guns were sent to Manila Bay to reinforce the um, harbor defenses of Manila in light of the Japanese threat. And the last gun for Battery Kirby was shipped out in one of the last convoys that left San Francisco's Fort Mason and headed to Manila just before the war broke out. So there's a very tangible connection between the fortifications in San Francisco and those in... Um, okay, what happened to the... Okay. And... Um, and, and those in Manila Bay. Now, Fort Mason, now the home of Fort Mason Center and the arts and theater programs and Green's Restaurant and other uh, popular destinations, was the Army's port. It was the Army's port of embarkation and that's where they sent troops and supplies. So, um, that's where the guns from Battery Kirby went, and that's where at least a half a dozen convoys were sent in the early year, months of 1941 to help uh, um, supply that uh, rapidly uh, growing and training uh, force of Filipinos and Americans who were defend the harbor. Um, later, there was a, um, a sort of a bitter poem that at least at the time, you know, by the time, I mean 70 years ago, was kind of famous. And it was written by a journalist who was um, on Corregidor Island and was actually the last journalist to, to leave uh, before the surrender. And it was, it, was, it was the Battling Bastards of Bataan poem, pardon my French, and, and it went, we're the Battling Bastards of Bataan, no mama, no papa, no Uncle Sam, no aunts, no uncles, no cousins, no nieces, no pills, no planes, no artillery pieces, and nobody gives a damn. Right? Well, that's certainly how it seemed to the people in the Philippines who were promised U.S. help, but where was that help? It was sitting on the bottom of Pearl Harbor, and the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was specifically aimed at uh, getting the U.S. fleet out of the way of interfering with the Japanese conquest of the Philippines and Southeast Asia. But uh, the, as a for instance, um, the battling bastards might have been slightly mollified to know that at least we were trying. And uh, in November 1941, uh, the last ships uh, to leave uh, San Francisco uh, for the Philippines departed on the 21st of November 1941. They had 48 artillery pieces, 52 dive bombers, 18 fighters, 123 machine guns, 680,000 rounds of machine gun ammunition, 5,000 bombs, 6,000 drones of aviation oil, 29,000 drones of aviation gasoline, uh, stores and supplies, steel helmets, blankets, tires, gas masks, torpedoes, mail, and Christmas parcels. Okay. 
So it was Pearl Harbor that interrupted the intended rescue of the Philippines that was in the war plans. And that rescue was mounted from San Francisco's Fort Mason. You can see the supply ships at the piers now, which now house the Cowell Theater and other performing arts venues, and are about to house the graduate programs of the San Francisco Art Institute over the next year or two. Over the course of World War II, um, 23 million tons of supplies and one and a half million troops went overseas to fight the Pacific War, including the Philippines from San Francisco's Fort Mason. Now, here's Manila Bay. And there's Corregidor. Right? This is Bataan over here. So Bataan was, uh, as Cecilia uh, stated, uh, defended by 60,000 or so Philippine troops and uh, about 12,000 American troops. The elite of the Philippine troops uh, were not in what was called the Philippine Army, um, but were actually soldiers of the United States Army in units that were called Philippine Scouts. And uh, this is a photograph of uh, an American officer uh, on the right and senior Philippine uh, sergeants or, or non-commissioned officers who uh, were commanded the 57th Philippine scouts that fought on Bataan. And this was pretty much, you know, the deal is you had white officers and Philippine soldiers. Um, that was the times. I couldn't do a you know, more eloquent job. I don't want to linger on the death march, but they surrendered, went to the death march. Here's Corregidor. Corregidor was the last holdout, and it lasted until um, um, May of 1942, um, long after the, 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 the uh, the, the British, uh, Malaya, and Singapore had fallen, and the Japanese had conquered Burma, and they're on their way to India, and these troops are still holding out in the Philippines, practically till the time of the Battle of Midway off of Hawaii that kind of turned the naval tide of World War II. You can see that uh, uh, there are various uh, uh, gun batteries uh, marked here, and here, and here, and here. Uh, these are similar to, this is Corregidor, and of course, you could see the similarity right away with the photo I showed you of Battery Kirby over here, or those that you recognized from taking snapshots of the Golden Gate from Consulman Road. Now, here's the, some of the more other remarkable connections. The main road out to the Marin Headlands, if you don't take the windy road up on the hills, but you go through the tunnel, that's called Bunker Road. So everybody thinks, of course, it's named because of the bunkers that it leads to, all those fortifications. Well, they're wrong. It was named after this man, Colonel Paul D. Bunker, United States Army. This is a remarkable story. He was one of the senior commanders of the heavy guns that defended Corregidor and kept the Japanese Navy out of Manila Bay and far enough away that they couldn't bombard the troops on Bataan. When Corregidor surrendered, Bunker lowered the last United States flag to fly in the Philippines. And he kept a piece of it, and he cut it up, and he sewed it in his uniform, and he carried it with him all the way to prison camp, and in 1944, he died of sickness in the prison camp, but his fellow officers kept that flag and brought, him back, brought it back when they were liberated after the war, and that little fragment of the United States flag, the last to fly in the Philippines, and the symbol of the, the length of 
Filipino-American resistance to the invasion still exists, and it's in the collection of West Point. Now the other road that many of you drive out on the way to Sausalito. This isn't the main road, this is the east road on the eastern side of the peninsula. It's quieter, it's more scenic. Some of you may take it if you go down the Horseshoe Cove and then you drive up towards Sausalito the back way. It's a very nice bike ride. And if you haven't taken it, I recommend you do. Well, it's called East Road and naturally everybody thinks it's because it's the easternmost road on the uh, peninsula. And they're wrong too, because it was named after this guy, Major Joe C. East. And Major East commanded the, a battery, a gun battery on Corregidor of the 91st Coast Artillery Regiment manned by Philippine scouts. Okay. Doing research for this presentation, I came across uh, some of the um, artifacts that Major West was able to keep uh, after the surrender, and it included a roster book of his unit. And although I certainly realize that I'm talking about uh, how the United States Army recognized the contributions of its white officers, after the war by naming the roads after them, and they didn't name any roads after the Filipino soldiers that died in their service. Well, the best I can do here is honor their memory by pointing to their names and telling you all that the names of those soldiers are preserved somewhere for us to remember. And finally, the piece de resistance of Marin Headlands Roads is Consulman Road. And here I, can, I don't have some, you know, funny little trick to play on you and say, ah, you thought Consulman was, you know, something else. It's named after Claire M. Consulman. And Consulman was um, the, actually the inspector of harbor defenses for Manila Bay. He died on one of these Japanese prison ships. They were <clears throat> atrocious conditions. Hundreds of people were chucked into the hold of, of, uh, of these ships without any latrine facilities, uh, with, that, with, with hardly any water and hardly any food. And tragically, even more tragically, the ships were unmarked. They, they, they didn't carry red crosses or anything on them. And as they tried to make the dash to Japan, many of them were sunk by U.S. planes and submarines, including the one that carried Claire Consulman. After the liberation of the Philippines, many of the survivors from the Bataan Death March and imprisonment in, in, in the Philippines were sent home and they were welcomed as heroes at San Francisco's Fort Mason. This photograph was actually taken practically from my window at the park headquarters today. Um, in the upper right across a corner across the street, that's Gal Galileo High School. And, um, and these are the, the, uh, the hospital buses arriving uh, for uh, um, uh, to, to meet the liberated bastards of Bataan, if you will. Um, the, um, I well realize that many of the photo archives do not show Filipino faces at the time, um, but I do the best I can with what I have in an attempt to um, show that our national park's history sometimes is a little hidden, but if you, you know, if you kind of peel away the layers, you'll see different kinds of faces. I know I'm kind of intuiting here because there's no labels to who these people are except that they're meeting a returning troop ship. So I'll just make a wild guess that, that those may be Philippine um, faces there. 
um, and if not, they still show the ethnic diversity of uh, whoever was on those ships coming back after a grueling time overseas to be back in the States. So um, I hope that will encourage you to visit our national park. Um, as I said uh, at the beginning, if I flip back here very quickly, um, this uh, sign to guide you around will be uh, at, on exhibit until December, and then afterwards we'll have it up for a while at the Marin Headlands Visitor Center, and it's got the pictures and pretty much a capsule version of what I just told you. Well, thanks very much for your, uh, your attention. I appreciate being here.